The Cold War ended in 1989. The Soviet Union collapsed, which was one of the most phenomenal events in history in 1991. The United States went to war in the same year, 1991, in the Gulf. It scored a stunning victory in the Gulf War. Through that victory, it reasserted a fundamental dictum of empire, the control of resources, must remain in the hands of the empire, which is what the Gulf War was all about. An American historian described the Gulf War and its underlying motive in three words. He said the Gulf War is about oil, oil, oil. <laughs> That's what the Gulf War was all about. And if one looks at the pattern that unfolded after that, you would see that the control of resources, of oil in particular, was vital to Washington. Whatever the other motives behind the war in Afghanistan in the year 2001, there's no doubt at all that oil was also a factor. Not oil in Afghanistan, because Afghanistan does not have any oil, but access to oil producing states around Afghanistan, the whole Central Asian region. A number of states which are very rich in oil. In fact, oil analysts will tell you that Caspian Sea oil, oil from the Central Asian region, would equal oil from Saudi Arabia in the year 2010. It's a huge oil producing belt. And then you have the Iraq war, which is also related to oil. The weapons of mass destruction were actually the weapons of mass distraction. It doesn't attempt to distract people from the real goal, the real motive, and the real motive was oil. It's not just control over resources. Empire is also about defending and perpetuating a particular ideology. Washington has become deeply wedded to the ideology of the Washington Consensus. And what is that ideology of the Washington Consensus? Meaning by which the Treasury, Wall Street, and various business interests linked to Wall Street. It is the pursuit of the American version of capitalism. And what is that version of capitalism? It is liberalization, deregulation, and privatization on a massive scale. It is ensuring the triumph of capital in its rawest form. This is what American capitalism is all about. And its adversary is not just other ideologies, whether it's communism or various variants of socialism or Islam or what have you. Its rivals would include other forms of capitalism. European capitalism, for instance, would be a rival. Capitalism shaped to some extent by welfareism and humanitarian concerns. East Asian capitalism would also be a rival because that's capitalism driven by the state, shaped by the state. That is also a rival, which is why you will see that in the last couple of decades, the United States has targeted other forms of capitalism. Europe has been persuaded to privatize, to deregulate, to liberalize, to dismantle its welfare institutions. And East Asian capitalism suffered a major setback in the 1997-1998 financial crisis, which some economists would argue was manipulated in order to weaken another approach to capitalism. So the whole purpose of this exercise is to ensure 
that a particular type of capitalism is ascendant, that it's dominant. This is also related to militarism, war, and violence. In order to maintain this sort of capitalism, you need military strength. And military strength that played a very big role in perpetuating the American version of capitalism. Let us just reflect on some of the things we have talked about. Afghanistan, a war takes place. It's the expansion of bases after that. Bases in five Central Asian republics. Before that, the Gulf War. A war takes place. The victor establishes bases in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain. Iraq, there are a number of bases in Iraq today. So military bases are very much part of the pattern. And maintaining military dominance is fundamental to this imperialism, as it has been to past imperialisms. You have to maintain your military ascendancy. And for the United States today, this is a major goal. It spends $400 billion a year on the military. This is its military budget, $2 trillion over the next five years. It has hundreds of bases all over the world, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. In just two countries, South Korea and Japan, it has a total of 100,000 soldiers. And Okinawa in Japan is virtually an American colony. This is imperial power. Now, when you reflect on this, you have to ask yourselves, what does this imperial power mean? Because war and violence is central to the maintenance and perpetuation of power, we would regard this as the most horrendous consequence of empire. Because this means that lives are lost all the way. People are killed. Human dignity is trampled upon. We know that after the end of the Second World War, millions of human beings have been killed in a number of wars connected with the Cold War. Of course, the Soviet Union was also responsible for these deaths. But after the end of the Cold War, the killing fields continue. Military budgets continue to expand. Arms sales continue to expand. It is amazing that in 1997, six years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States military expenditure had actually gone up, though there was no Rival on the horizon, but the obsession with militarism was still there. And because it impacts upon human lives, it is to concern all of us. 